Well, you might tell by the date that it's a Saturday, and I don't normally work on Saturdays, but a heat wave is kind of settled on San Francisco, and I don't feel like going anywhere or doing anything. So I came over to the shop where it's relatively cool, and I actually have a one-day build to do today. And it involves something I've done a bunch of show and tells on recently, uh, which is on some of my drafting tools, angle finders, iris, circle templates, uh, folding rulers, etc. And as I looked around at different show and tells I could do about drafting tools, I noticed, my God, I can't wait for a haircut. As I looked around at my beautiful drafting tools, I noticed that I had a number of them and I had them in several different locations. I had some of my drafting tools in here in my machinists and watchmakers toolboxes. I had some of my drafting tools hanging up here, and I still have a couple of large items hanging up here. I had some in the drawers labeled rulers, and I just, you know, you look for the convenient solutions in a shop, but sometimes you end up with like three different solutions, three different versions of the same solution for the same problem. And so I realized I wanted all of my drawing aid I wanted all of my drafting aids that are specific implements that need to be kept in good condition for when they need to be utilized, which is not often, right? So I wanted a single storage space for all of them. And I know that years ago I said drawers are where things go to die, and I still believe that. However, sometimes when a drawer is purpose-built, like some of the drawers in my workbench, like here are some of my combination squares. That's been a very successful execution of a place to keep those. And also here in the workbench, I keep chisels, bench dogs, planes, and the super sharpened chisels and spoon chisels and drawers. I'm gonna put my drafting tools in a drawer, but the difficulty is I need a big wide flat drawer. Now, where is there a space in my shop for a big, wide, flat drawer. Could that be it right there? Could this underside of this workbench I recently modified and upgraded be the perfect location for a drafting drawer? Why, yes, I believe so. And so, I'm gonna build one. And I'm gonna use, I'm gonna make a drawer. I'm going to install it. I'm gonna fill it full of my drafting tools. I'm gonna use drawer slides. You haven't seen me use drawer slides before because I very rarely use drawer slides. But I have this nice pair of, I think, 14 inchers. 16 inchers, yeah. Uh, and these will fit beautifully underneath this table and give me a drawer of reasonable depth. And yeah, drafting aids are all gonna be in here and well covered and I'm kinda of psyched about it. Mm-hmm. Cause they'll live there for a long time, yeah. All right, here we go. a lot on time lapse so far. Um, I have installed, 
I've installed the brackets to which I will attach my drawer slides. And these are, this is a simple uh, angle bracket made out of plywood. I've got, uh, you can see here, I've got a little offshoot of it. I've stapled that from the other side and screwed it up into the bench. So that's a nice solid upright. Uh, it's coming down just far enough to support the drawer brackets. Uh, and the width between this minus the, the thickness of these drawer brackets is 37 and 5 eighths. That's a nice wide drawer. It's going to be 16 inches deep. Yep. Um, I have to install the drawer slides to the drawer first. So I got to build that drawer and then I'm going to fill that drawer. Fill that drawer! Um, so the next step is to make the four sides of the drawer and then to uh, wrap it out uh, a, a channel in the bottom for the floating bottom. The, uh, the drawer is coming along nicely. Ugh. I've cut out four sides. I've notched a rabbit in the bottom of each of the four sides that carefully fits my nice big piece of glue on for the floating bottom that sits right at the bottom there. I just did a test fit and um, the test fit works. So we're gonna do a final assembly on this drawer I know it seems like we're close to being done, but in fact, we're actually just beginning because there's a lot of customization in this, in this build. And this is, without a doubt, one of the larger drawers I've ever made. Uh, I'm excited about the stability that will be brought about by the drawer slides. That's something I'm particularly curious about. So, oh, right, here we go. Staple it into place. I know one of these days is to just do a straight glue and clamp, but I'm just too impatient. I know. All right. There we go. That is a drawer. Nice. All right. I think uh, I think it's time me to put in the drawer slides so uh, right what is the front and what is the back that I think is the back and I think this is the front yep okay so I need some little baby oh right okay so that's gonna sit like this yeah so that's my first one I'm gonna get a wood screw get that in Alexa, play. Ladies. Oh, hey. <laughs> Dude, that, that is a nice amount of functionality added to the cave. I'm not going to put a drawer handle here. I am simply just 
going to leave it like that. That is, look, it's not for, uh, you know, a bunch of cast iron tools, but it's plenty for some drafting tools. All right. Now the question is, what to put in there and how to put it in. Yeah, so I have, I've, I've had some ideas about this. I've got an interior of uh, 16 by 36 and 3 quarters. I climb up. Okay. So it's time to figure out how to parse out my drafting tools. Now, there are a few, there's two different categories, three different categories. One of them might not make it. One category is these. This is wood marking gauges. Um, I know there's some glass cutters on the table. They're not important to this narrative at, at all. Uh, and then I've been hiding this. You haven't seen this yet. Here are all the lovely drafting tools that I'd like to put in that drawer. Except that this distance here is 18 inches. Although this is not 36 and three quarters, this is much more like, it's like 32 or something like that. So I think I'm gonna pull the drawer back off of its drawer slides, put it on my workbench and start figuring out how to lay out what goes on in here. finished and my drafting tools are laid out in it for the most part uh, and now I have built the foam core liner for the drafting tools and now I'm going to start using these little foam core walls that I cut on the table saw they're about five eighths of an inch deep and I'm going to start uh, basically stitching in drawing fences around these tools so each one has a very specific location later each location will get a number and each tool will have a corresponding number so anyone who comes into this shop will know how to sort the drafting tools back into the drafting tools drawer. But for right now, we are just, it's now a kind of a process of place, build a wall, and stitch, and place and stitch. Because I've laid this out of what I think the wall width is going to be, but I can't know for sure. And I will make more efficient use of my space If I stitch as I go, that's all I'm saying. All right, I'm gonna set up a nice high time lapse and you get to watch the whole thing. talking about my philosophy as I go on with this because I mean with something like this look I'm mostly making a semi-specific location for everything and numbers will tell me where stuff is supposed to live but also like I don't want to get so specific I mean it's diminishing there's diminishing returns right in terms of the specificity but I'm pretty pleased with how this is playing out um, I, uh, my calipers, which I'm using more and more these days, now have a bonafide home, uh, as do, as do so many of the drafting tools that I've been like having to look for each time I needed them. So this, I think is going to streamline a bunch about my process. Um, and most of the reason I'm stitching as I go is because like even if I was going to build this this these tool borders out of wood, I would still mock it up in cardboard first, because that's the only way to really know 
that you're getting the shape right. You can draw it out, you can trace your tools and stuff, but only when you put the physical borders in are you going to like see the shape of how you want things to be. Yeah, that's a close one. Um, and when you see the shape of the way you want things to be, you can be a lot more efficient. Uh, so just to point out, like I'm going to get a lot more in here than I thought I was going to get uh, at the first blush. And that's cool. I find this work so, so relaxing. Oh, juicy fruit. Look at that. Oh, going to left-handed gluing, huh? Is that really feasible, Savage? Are you ambidextrous? I am moderately ambidextrous. You didn't know this about me. Or maybe you did. Maybe I've talked about it. Uh, juggling, I think, is one of the things that made me ambidextrous. Or maybe it was my ambidextrousness that made me good at juggling. Who can say? Chicken and egg. There's one tool in here that I don't use, that I won't use, but not because it doesn't work for me. It's just, it's too specific. And I'll show it to you. Yes, I will show it to you. But for me, every drawer that has a set of objects, I kind of always pay attention to if there needs to be a surreal object in the, in the collection. So I guess the long and short of what I was saying was, while this may seem like a weird way to come up with drawer separators, in my experience, it's the best way to come up with rigorously efficient drawer separations. And that when I eventually make, when I eventually make the Studley toolbox, when I make my version of the Studley toolbox, and it may be like 20 years from now, um, suffice to say, I will be um, mocking it up at a foam core first. And that actually speaks to what Studley did. He was, um, wait a minute, who is Studley? Who is Studley? Who made a toolbox whose name was Studley? I hear you asking. It is, um, it is the most important toolbox. You were wondering if there was a toolbox to end all toolboxes, one ring to rule them all, one toolbox to, to rule them all. Um, it is the Studley toolbox. And it was built, uh, I believe somewhere around 100 years ago by a master carpenter whose name was Studley. And if you search Studley, S-T-U-D-L-E-Y toolbox, pause right now, Google Studley, S-T-U-D-L-E-Y, toolbox, and then come on back. You see what I'm saying? You see what I mean? Yeah, man. Studley was Studley. Yeah. Um, it is an unbelievable achievement in toolboxage. Um, it is the gold standard. And there is a book. There's a fantastic book that breaks down the toolbox, its history, its construction, and... Not just its general construction, but its actual construction, like what goes where and how it's laid out. It's kind of mind-blowing how great that is. Uh, okay, it's time to move on to the compasses. And I'm very excited now because I've left a lot of room over here, and it's a good amount of room. Okay, so we have, I want to make these central, we have rulers. And we have scribes. And I think, I think that, yeah, I think that the scribes, the scribes could live like that. The rulers could live like that. And I don't need to worry too much about that separation. Yeah, so Studley, it, when you read the book, what you led, what you what you end up understanding is that Studley built his toolbox over many, many, <coughs> over many years. Is that how wide I want that to be for that? I think actually I think that scribes go down here and rulers go up there. So Studley did many experimentations with tool placement. It was a moving target, was the toolbox. And like all beautiful creations, in the end, it seems inevitable. 
that's something that's really important. Um, I will say that everything that's great, everything that like has a real impact on the world seems inevitable. I mean, I think it's no mistake that uh, that's what Thanos says, right? Um, I was just watching something the other night where someone said, real greatness is leaving every, making everything before you came obsolete and everything after you arrived changed. And that's a beautiful, beautiful marker of what it is to have a real effect. Um, but that's different than, just as a note, I think that's slightly different than, uh, well, I, I guess I'm crossing a couple of streams there in the discussion. But uh, So like Studley's toolbox looks completely overwhelming as a maker as a tool collector, as a lover of tools, and as a storyteller about craft and about the things that I make, that toolbox intimidates the shit out of me because it's an unbelievable achievement. But the thing that you'd learn if you went back in time and looked over Studley's shoulder while he was building it was that he's just a person and he was like hitting the same challenges we do for certain things. And, you know, the inevitability is... The, um, the inevitability of a perfect object is an illusion. Is it an illusion? It's kind of an illusion. Well, okay, I'll put it this way. I made some sculptures in my 20s, in my late teens and in my 20s, and some of them, I made a lot of sculpture in my late teens and early 20s. Uh, and some of them are still so astounding to me as creative expressions of my own that I don't remember how I made them. And I look at them and I think, how did I know how to make that? And I, I hope that you've had this experience. If you make stuff and you've gotten to a certain point, there is a point in which you look at some of the things you built and it feels like magic. It feels like something magic happened. I submit that something magic did happen. Something, what we call magic, what we can refer to as magic. We can call it the other. Jung might call it the collective unconscious. Um, religions might call it all sorts of other things. I personally think it's, you know, it's our sentience. It's the way in which when we tap into the personal, the super personal, the super individual, we're cracking into something universal. To know that what's true in your secret heart is true for all, that is genius, that's Emerson. Um, and so I try to remember not to be intimidated by Studley's incredible toolbox, even as I seek to emulate it with every fiber of my being. Okay, compasses, compass I, I say it. Look at all those beautiful things. Okay, I think that they should kind of go like this, and I wonder if I have enough room for them all to just sit like this. Uh, oh, I guess I could do cross, cross, cross. See, I think, if I'm really gonna be honest with myself, I think that it's better if I just do all of these in their own space and I don't try and get fancy with a layout. Yes, I have lots of little pencil things and those can go, yeah, this is laying out really, really well. Um, I think that these guys could all sort of live together since they're kind of map tracers. Look at that, six, one, two, three, seven compasses. Such wilt thou be to me who like the other foot must obliquely run. There's a great John Don poem in which he compares a, rom a, a romance to a compass like this. And he says, uh, ow, that actually hurts. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a John Donne poem where he compares one's uh, a relationship to a compass. And he says, thy soul, the fixed foot, or fixed foot, I'm not sure which, thy soul, the fixed foot makes no move to, thy soul, the fixed foot makes no show to move, but doth if the other do, right? The center foot does not seem to move, but it is moving because the other one does. And though it in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, see, the other leg is roaming far, it moves and hearkens after it. He's describing the process of when it goes far away, that center strut moves and hearkens after it. And when they start to come close together, he says, and grows erect as it comes home. And that's some of the Romantic imagery John Donne was hiding in his poetry. I believe that's what I was taught. Uh, yeah.
Yeah, I always liked the image of the compass as a romantic image. Okay, we are on the home stretch. I might need to cut some more cardboard, some more foam core strips, but we're very, very close. And I really, this I really like. I was super hoping to have this kind of, this kind of layout here. Yeah. I was super hoping to have that. So I didn't want to get super fancy with these. I just wanted to be able to grab whichever one I needed. I mean, I guess I could, no, I gotta be able to see them. I gotta be able to see them. That's, that's for darn sure. Feeling very good about this. Here are the drafting tools laid out. The angle finders, the compasses, the calipers, the protractors. Yeah, it's hard for me to remember the names for all these things sometimes. Uh, the dovetail cutters, just all these little sensitive drafting tools that need good places to live. Well, they now have good places to live and they're all going to move over. Whoop into the workbench. Uh, this took just a tiny bit longer than I thought it would, about three hours all told. Um, but I think this is my finest foam core drawer separator yet. <clears throat> and it's the first time I've actually used drawer slides. Okay, I have installed drawer slides before, but probably not since my theater days at the Eureka Theater in San Francisco in like 1991. Right, I think it's time to install. So here we go. This is a little bit of a, oh, oh. Oh, do you have some drafting tools? Why, yes I do. Ah, I need a drafting tool for that. Well, let me get it. Holy shit, that is satisfying. I know I don't curse very often in my videos. That's on purpose. I like to imagine that children are watching because I want, to make, I, I want to make content that children want to watch, but every now and then cursing is necessary, like emotionally. So kids, I'm just going to tell you, cursing is complicated. It is super cool when adults curse. It's just cool. That's, that's why it's cool to be an adult. You get to curse. And when you hear, when an adult hears a child curse, it's disgusting. It's just gross. It's, you shouldn't do it. So. The trick is, don't curse around adults. That's probably a bad lesson, but hey, you're letting your kid watch my videos. I'm gonna give them some life tips that I agree with that you may not. Oh, look at that. That is, this, this is gonna live in this workbench forever. I mean, uh, it, early on in the lockdown when I made this workbench really nice and solid, it has been fantastic. And now that it's got this, dude. Um, oh, right. I never did find a place for this, but I guess, I guess it, I guess it can live there. But no, no, it could also live, could it live there. Yes, it could live there. Okay. It can live on top. Oh, right. You were wondering what the object is. I said there was an object here that didn't quite belong here, but I like this object. So I'm going to put it there. So here we go. Said object. If you look at the bench at the, at this drawer, I don't know if you can easily spot the object. Boop, this one. Okay. What is special about these calipers? Well, they describe a relationship. The coolest thing about them is they describe this relationship constantly. So there is a relationship between this side of the calipers and that side. And that relationship remains constant no matter how far open they are. That is something I didn't know about this kind of mechanical linkage, and I find it really neat. 
The relationship between this side and that side does not change. The fraction does not change no matter how wide you open it. And I'm sure many of you have guessed it. The relationship is the golden ratio. Yeah, um, this is not a video in which I'm going to explain the golden ratio. You can look it up like you looked up the Studley Toolbox and enjoy a lifetime of examining the golden ratio and all of its mythology, all of its uh, overwrought uh, uh, commitment, and also all of its magical properties, because it's true on all the senses that it's a little bit overdone and it's also kind of magical and amazing. And I love these calipers. They're, they're completely useless in my normal life, and yet they deserve a place <laughs> among the beautiful drafting tools that I own. And I'll lay this guy near it so that at least the space is occupied by somebody who has utility. Yeah, you wanna see what it looks like? Here we go. There's the workbench. It's really nice and solid. There is the drawer. You can see it's pretty unassuming. I'm gonna put a label on there that says drafting tools at some point. I'm not sure what that label should look like, but here we go. <gasps> oh, yeah. <sighs> that is really neat. Not only is that neat, but like I covered it even though I made it. There you go. That is a terrific heat wave Saturday one day build. Uh, a new drawer of drafting tools that will remain dust free and well protected in my space. Here, let's open that one more time so you can see it. Oh man, that is just incredible. I know. Ooh, whoops. Flexible arm of my camera. Um, I know that many of you will write to me and say you should have X, Y, and Z tools in here, and I'm probably going to go through the comments and order some stuff because that's just that's just what happens. That's that's how that works. Uh, thank you guys for joining me for this quickie one day build. Well, I don't know how long it's going to be when we edit it, but thanks for joining me. Have a great weekend. See you soon. Thanks for watching that video. If you'd like to support us further, you could do it by purchasing a poster from us in the merch store. Uh, there's some brand new ones. This one is my sketch of the NASA ACES suit. I decided to replicate the classic orange NASA shuttle pumpkin suit a few years ago for New York Comic Con. And in doing so, I did tons and tons of sketches, but this was kind of my main uh, library sketch. It's the taxonomy of all the major details. Each piece of this I then did further sketches and drawings of, but this was sort of my main map. It's printed on a beautiful heavy cardstock. You can use it to maybe make your own suit or just frame it and put it on your wall. You can buy one by following the links below.